Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our final speaker for this morning's session is Nathan Heath. Nathan Heath works for Murray CMA and is a New Zealander. We won't hold either of those against him. Nathan is a soil scientist with local and international expertise in soil health. He's previously worked on soil fertility and pastoral soil management in New Zealand and Ecuador, and he's been involved in a range of soil measurement projects in, in Murray catchment looking at the soil carbon and biology status of the catchment soils. Nathan. Thanks, Chris. Um, first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge the support of GRDC. Um, a lot of the funding that we've put into this day today has actually come from a project that we're working in close relation with GRDC, which uh, who Pauline Mealy is actually project leader of, so I'm making sure Pauline had heard that. Um, look, basically we just want to talk about, um, I suppose we, we're scaling up to some degree some of the talks that have happened this morning, um, and we're very interested at, from a catchment perspective what, uh, what's going on out there. And so we've done a lot of work over the last three, four years in trying to get a better understanding of, of how all these things that we've talked about this morning apply in our own catchment. And, and one of the key things is why. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, they're very sensitive. The, the organisms in the soil change quickly to management, to rainfall all, very quickly. They're also a very good indicator of soil health. So when we talk about soil health, we've moved on from just chemistry and physics. We're now talking about biology. So we wanted to make sure that we represented the biology when we were measuring the health of our catchment soils. Um, you hear a lot of, you will hear a lot more now about resilience. And resilience is basically the ability of the soil to restore its functions. So those are the properties and the processes that occur in the soil naturally. Resilience is a soil's ability after a disturbance to bring those back into what they were before or to some semblance of what they were before. Um, the other thing is uh, we talk about ecosystem servicing now. So when we talked about those properties and processes that occurred in the soil, the ecosystem services are the things that we benefit from. Biology play a key role in those. Um, it's intimately linked in soil carbon sequestration and, and, and carbon cycling and that sort of thing. Um, and also biodiversity. So as a catchment management authority, we're interested in biodiversity. I heard a fantastic quote from Professor Ian Young from the University of New, uh, New England that said, if the last blue whale choked on the last panda bear on Earth, it would be a tragedy, but the world wouldn't stop turning. If the last two ammonium oxidising bacteria disappeared, we'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so um, they're very important to our systems, and they're going to become increasingly more important as the future when things like we were uh, Pauline mentioned, you know, the diminishing resources, increased demand for food, there's going to be more reliance on these things. So we've had a lot to do in the last three years, and in fact we've invested probably in the vicinity of $700,000 in soil biology related projects over that period of time. We're currently working um, on some nationwide projects. So this, the DAF um, CSIRO Soil Carbon Research Project is going across Australia, and we are the only catchment management authority in the whole of Australia that's actually doing a project on our own. Um, and at the same time, we've piggybacked on top of that this um, project that Pauline's leading, um, which is looking at those biological monitoring suite that um, Pauline mentioned, the microbial biomass and that sort of thing. I'll talk about it a bit more in a minute. Um, and so those things have, uh, and, and all the work that we've done up, leading up to that have allowed us to start spinning things off from there. So we're looking at working a lot. You'll hear from Jenny Hawkins this afternoon, but um, we're things that we're sort of working with Jenny's group in the future to start taking some of this information out into the field. Um, we've done a lot of work in, in getting that information out there. And, uh, we've done a, quite a few capacity building events, and this being one of them. Um, and we've benchmarked, so we're starting to accumulate probably the, one of the biggest um, data sets of biological information at, at, a, at a level um, in New South Wales, that's for sure. Um, and we've done a lot of other things in the past, so that's leading on to a, um, a, just the tracks more interest. So we're starting to do more work and looking at how that might influence things like carbon trading, how that influences the, the changing stocks and the flows of where carbon's going in our catchment. So this is um, Mick Davey, who's looking after our soil carbon research project. This is 200 sites throughout the catchment where we're keeping the soil types very simple. So we're only looking at one or two different, one soil type in particular, and we're comparing three different management practices. So we're really trying to see what impact the, the land use is having on the different fractions of carbon in the soil. So we're talking the, you know, the humus, the labile carbon, and, and the char. Um, uh, this is just uh, 
some of the work that we've done in the past, uh, we had a meeting in the middle which was a community-based project um, up in Holbrook and as a result of that we had um, well over 500 people attend different events where we attracted a wide range of soil biology experts into the catchment and uh, we filmed each one of them, created a DVD and that was a fantastic experience in terms of really broadening our knowledge base of what was going on out there. There are a few limited DVDs left, uh, there's a few on the table out there but we're rapidly running out of them. Um, and so we sort of had these type of events and, and there is so much interest out there and it just hasn't waned. People are still coming along to, to hear more about soil biology and the impact of soil biology on their production systems. Um, and our own monitoring, we had, um, we've, at this point in time, we've got 107 sites that represent the most dominant soil types and land uses across our catchment and we've got biological indicators for each one of those. So that's just a snapshot of some of the diversity of where we're taking these measures from. So why are we doing this? Um, we, well, basically we're trying to build a data set of benchmarks within our catchment um, and we hope that that will lead to bigger and brighter things in the future. Um, it's, from our perspective, you've got to remember we've, we've got 107 sites, it's a very expensive exercise, so when we were out there looking at what sort of methods we could probably use or possibly use from a catchment monitoring method, we found there was a number of limitations and one of the primary ones that I haven't put up there is cost. A lot of these things are very expensive. Um, and if you're doing a lot of measurement, and we, we did it at 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30 depth increments, and you're doing that a couple of times on each site, then you, it doesn't take long to wrap up quite a cost. So the, the, the variability is quite important. You know, if you've got a lot of something that varies very rapidly over time or over space, you can't use it as an indicator that's monitoring the condition of your catchment. So we need things that are quite robust, that don't just change overnight. Um, we also needed things that represented something. So there's a lot of indicators out there, but often the numbers don't really mean anything yet because they're new tests or they're tests that haven't been used widely. We, don't, we aren't able to say, well, what does that mean for my own production system? Um, and so we, we had a look around. We um, talked to a number of people, a lot of the experts that came to our events. We discussed that with them. Um, and we wanted to make sure that the indicators that we used were practical, that, that in the future you guys would use them yourselves. So this is, um, you would have seen this slide before, we um, struck up a relationship with the University of Western Australia, Lynn Abbott and Dan Murphy over there, and they're creating a, a fantastic um, suite of monitoring indicators that's backed up by strong science and great uh, delivery methods of, of getting that information out there. So this is an example of the, the front page of the Soil Quality website, soilquality.org.au. Have a look at it. Eventually all our data will be on there. So that includes what we've done today, plus as part of this GRDC soil biology project where we will be testing 200 sites across the catchment for a raft of different biological indicators, that'll be on there as well. So yeah, that's, um, I mentioned that first bit there, we, we um, have adopted this suite of information and look, it's, it's been fantastic for us. Um, basically the three indicators that we're doing, uh, or the three key measurements, three, four, total organic carbon, which most people can do and most people have done in the past, but we're very interested in the labile component, the labile carbon component, which is basically that, that, that relatively fresh, relatively weakly decomposed fraction of organic carbon. So when you know, leaf, uh, leaf matter hits the deck, it's basically the, that as a carbon source until it gets to a stage where it's started slowing down, the rate of breakdown's gotten pretty slow, and its value as a food source for the organisms has started to decline quite significantly. So it's um, really when we talk about labile carbon, it's basically the fuel in the tank that drives biological cycling. Um, Microbial biomass carbon, which Pauline mentioned about, and this is really our primary indicator of, of population or biology, you know, what biology is present and in what numbers. So that's our key indicator for that. And then has another one, uh, potentially mineralizable nitrogen, which is basically an indicator of, of some of the functions that these organisms perform. So it's a measure of, of the, the, the organism's ability to convert organic matter to nitrogen in the soil. So it's an important, important factor for us. Um, so basically we, we aren't able to afford DNA sequencing, we aren't able to afford looking at other things, but we're using these as surrogates for those into the future. So what do we know, what have we learned from that? We've learnt this is a graph of the total organic, soil organic carbon levels across the Murray catchment and we've learnt that we've got on average pretty low levels. Along the bottom you'll see that's the carbon percent and along the top, along the um, vertical you'll see that's the number of sites. So across the catchment we haven't got a lot of levels, you know, it's, most of it's below 2 percent. We know roughly where those carbon levels are across the catchment so we've got those are uh, there's 4,000 sites in total, but across the catchment, we have, we're getting a pretty good idea of where carbon's high, 
where carbon's low, and we can also, from that, start saying, well, why isn't that particular part of the catchment equally high in carbon, or why is that lower than other areas? We know, like everybody else, we know that rainfall's a factor. You can see across there from the different rainfall bands, again, this is from uh, 4,000 sites. Basically, until you get around about 600 millimetres, the rainfall isn't having a big impact on those low rainfall sites on carbon levels. We also know, and we will know a lot more in the future from these really specific soil testing programs that are looking at comparing management practices, we know that land use has a big impact on microbiota, on carbon and um, by relationship with the biology. So from our benchmarking sites, the only relationship to land use we could find was basically improved pastures. Everything else was much of a muchness. We will know a lot more about that in the future. And we know there's a very strong relationship, and that hence the reason we're using these things, there's a strong relationship between the population of organisms in the soil and the amount of food that you provide them. So basically we've found that we can extend our range of monitoring tools and we can use biological indicators to provide some pretty good information about a more holistic approach to soil health in our catchment. And this is basically comparing the ratio of that fresh, well that fuel source that I was talking about, the label carbon, to the total carbon pool. So we can use that as an indicator of soil health. Um, where to from here? The key thing is to be able to turn this information into, into some action, into knowledge that, that people can use. Um, and we're very keen to keep pursuing that into the future. So unless it gets out into the field, unless people can actually use this for their own benefit, then we're really wasting our time in the first place. Um, through these other two projects, uh, where we will have some really definitive information at a regional scale, we're hoping to, that will really assist us in, in getting a really clear message or something that we can really use to help people on their own properties. Um, it'll also help us refine our monitoring in the future and given that we're going to have 300 sites throughout the catchment now where we have indicators for biological fertility, it just means that um, we're, you know, we're in a great position to capitalise in the future if people come up with um, initiatives to, to look at soil biology work in the future. So we're hoping that all our work in the past and the information that we're generating from this will really help us ahead in the future. Um, basically, that's it. I didn't want to hold up too much of your time. I know you're hungry and, and that sort of thing, but we've, um, we've got to stand out the front here. There's a bit of information on the soil quality website. We've also got a couple of the DVDs and there are a number of our staff um, wandering around. So please feel free to uh, come and chat to us and have a talk. If you would like more information from the Murray CMA website, you can um, contact me directly and I'm more than happy to um, talk to you about anything we're doing. Uh, and I'd just like to make a quick statement. We're just about to release our uh, incentive programs again. Um, so they'll be out on the 1st of July, which is where we uh, provide funding for landholders to invest in projects that will improve soil conditions. So keep an eye out for those. Thank you.